Excellent. Okay, so momentum part four, and about to appear on the screen is this wonderful picture of a train on its tracks. Last week we talked about getting this train. We're all on the train, right? Good, excellent. Getting the train on the right tracks, and then off we go. And I've spent three weeks with great enthusiasm extolling the virtues of our new mission statement, which is that we are going to meet with God, and we're going to walk with God, and we're going to serve God. That's simply what we feel God's called us to do, and that's what we're going to do, and that's what we're going to help other people to do. And Sunday morning is wonderful because it's an opportunity for us all to meet with God. And I don't know whether you get that privilege through the week. I, I don't know what you do. I don't know how close your walk is, but I, my, my commission is to make sure that once a week we have a fantastic opportunity to meet with him and to draw on his grace and receive that fresh infilling of his power. The series title is Momentum. And as I've said every week, and I'll say every single week, thank God for momentum. Because I've been in churches that have momentum, and I've been in churches that don't have momentum, and I know which one I prefer. And it's a very precious commodity and for us the challenges as leaders as pastors is how how do we steward this thing well that God has blessed us with what can we do as a church to increase our progress from here to there and our aim is to is to set up a system or a process a model if you like that is perfectly designed to move us to far from back then where we've been to over there where we're going. We're on a journey from here to there. And I've had a couple of comments uh, since last week to, to, to really do this. Jamie, could you just clarify for us, for a minute or two, what you mean by there? And so that's, that's what I'm going to do. If we are on a journey, and if we're going from here to there, we need to know where, where there is. So pretty simple, really. Here is where we are right now. And you're here this morning, so you are seeing a snapshot today of here. But see, the thing is, we have a dream. We have a a promised land. And we call it there. It's a destination, if you like. Where is here? Let's ask that question to begin with. Well, do you know what? Here's pretty good. I mean, here's not bad, is it? Let's face it. I mean, we quite like it, don't we? I mean, God is here. Amen. He's at work and things are moving and we're making progress. You know, the, the church is full of, of wonderful people and we're enjoying ourselves, aren't we? Amen. At least a, bit, a little bit. Yeah, you can admit it. Yeah. You know, we baptize five to ten people a year. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. You know, we see prayers answered. Quite a lot, actually. You know, occasionally we see people physically healed but nothing like as much as we'd like to. You know, we are making, I think, a small difference. You know, this church is on the map. Some people out there have heard of us. We have some reputation, at least. We're making a ripple. But you know what? We need to make a splash. So where is there? Oh, there is so much better. There is bigger. There is brighter. There is the land that we call revival. There is the place where at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. There is the place where souls are being saved every day. There is the place where the numbers of people being radically, supernaturally, miraculously healed is extraordinary. There is the place where we don't have empty seats, but we have queues of people around the block rushing to meet with God. There is the place that the book of Acts, Acts 2, calls awe. Amen. There isn't just a trickle. There is a flood. Yeah. You know, we've tried to articulate there in our vision statement. And our vision statement is great, but if, if I'm honest, it's, it's pretty mild, I reckon. Because in my wildest dreams, I go a lot further than that. And in, in our vision statement, We say something like this, the church that we see is first of all alive. The church that we see is vibrant and passionate and expectant. And I thank God that that's who we have in this room today. That's wonderful. But we're here and we're headed for there. The church that we see is spirit-filled. 
in the church that we see over there, God is on the move to the point where you can feel his presence, you can sense his power, you can see his influence. The church that we see is growing. Everything is growing because it's so healthy. It's growing bigger, it's growing stronger, it's growing more influential. The church that we see is transformational. Things are changing all the time. Lives are changing, relationships are changing, even the community that we're based in is changing. The church that we see is a family full of vibrant relationships and connections and partnerships and mentorships. Everywhere you look, you can see and sense and taste and smell love and joy and peace because we're family. And finally, the church that we see is equipping. People are being powered, equipped and released all the time. And the teams are flourishing and gifts are flowing and people are fulfilled and fruitful. And that's a foretaste of what there looks like. I'd say this, how big can you dream? How far can we go? You know, we have come a long way, folks, but there's still a long way to go yet. And here's an important point. You know, we could be satisfied with here. Some of you may be, actually. I mean, presumably we're here because we like it here. But my job is to create a holy dissatisfaction, a thirst for more, an openness to change, a willingness to follow the Lord wherever he chooses to lead us. And I sense that, that hunger in you, people. And well done. I say with that heart, we can go far. Do you know, we may even make it there. But I tell you what, I intend to have a lot of fun on the way. So the, the multi-million dollar question that we've been asking in this series is, how do we get there? How do we continue along that journey? How do we get closer to there? Uh, and our mission statement, and we, we've laid this out quite clearly. I'm sure you've all got it. Traffic light picture coming as we speak. We, we're going to meet with God. We're going to walk with God. And we're going to serve God. That's what God has called us to do. And that is what we're going to do. And we're going to continue to build our model of church around that statement, that purpose, that process. But let's face it. Strategies and processes are fine. But we won't get anywhere near there without the supernatural hand of God. You know, we've all seen systems go stale and dry up and just become the same old, same old routine. We may even have been to churches like that. It's a big problem, I think, for some of the traditional churches. And here's the key. All systems and strategies and mission statements do, all they do is to make room for God. Otherwise, frankly, they're just another pointless initiative. See, this is why I like this statement, meet, walk and serve. Because without the supernatural hand of God, meet, frankly, is just dry, flat, religious observance. Without the supernatural hand of God, a walk is just empty, lonely and directionless. Without the supernatural hand of God, serve is a lot of sweat for next to no reward. But with God, with the supernatural hand of God, meat becomes encounter. Amen. Where his presence is tangible, his voice is audible, and his power is visible. With God, with the supernatural hand of God, walk becomes drawing on his grace. It becomes a dialogue with the Holy Spirit. It becomes a growing in empowerment and intimacy and direction and inspiration. And with God, serving is, is more than just sowing a load of dead seed, but the reaping of a supernatural harvest, producing the fruit of the Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Spirit, Amen. and unleashing the power of the Spirit. Yeah. And given the choice there of without and with, I don't know about you, I choose with. Amen. So for today then, 
if process and organization are helpful, which they are, how do we make sure that they achieve the objective of making room for what Bill Johnson calls the more of the Lord? How do we do that? How do we touch heaven so we can change earth? How do we open ourselves up so we can be open to God? How do we cross over from the natural, which is limited, into the supernatural, which is limitless? How do we empty ourselves so that we can be filled? How do we crucify our flesh so we can step into the Spirit? That's the challenge. I'm going to tell you a story which I find humorous. I didn't find it humorous at the time, but as I look back on it, I do. And actually, I was thinking, you know, it's almost exactly eight years since I started living faith in Collingwood and I became a grown-up pastor all of my own. About eight years. February 2000, whatever it was, seven. Is that eight years? 2007. And, uh, you know, I got my feet under the chair and my piano stool probably and and we were a few months in and I got myself into good routines of going to the coffee shop where I could study. I loved studying the coffee shop. My office was freezing cold uh, there in the church, no windows. And I liked to get out in the community a bit. And I used to go to a, a coffee house called Williams Coffee Pub. And it was great because one of the guys there, actually I discovered, was a, uh, was a retired pastor, a Pentecostal Assemblies of God, uh, Canada pastor. And he, bless him, always used to give me refills and pay for it himself. So I'd go there at the start, I'd buy myself a coffee and a, a cookie, uh, and then he'd keep me lu- luxuriously equipped for the whole morning. And all was going reasonably well. And then I remember driving home from William's Coffee Pub one day, and I remember as clear as a bell, the Lord said to me, Jamie, all those things that you used to criticize, you're now doing. Ouch, that wasn't what I was looking to hear. You know, and he said to me, you must unlearn and relearn in order to stop doing what you've always criticised and what you've always known is counterproductive. You know, for years in churches, I'd sat on a piano stool as, as a worship leader, really frustrated, thinking, please, will you let the worship go? You know, we let the worship go so far, bottle it up, and then the pastor would go out to preach. I wanted to say every now and again, let's loosen control and let him in. Got me frustrated. And then we get to the end of the service and the pastor would have preached a great message. And then we'd say, we'd kind of say, well, thank you for coming, everybody. The coffee queue's over there. You know, God bless you. Closing prayer. And off we'd go. And I'd be thinking, no, inside of me, say no. Rather than just finishing the sermon and going home, let's let God in. Let's open the door. Let's have some ministry. You know, he's here. He's spoken. Let's let him in to do what needs to be done right now. And then I'd be sitting on a Sunday evening. We had church in the morning and in the evening. And I'd be about 10 minutes through the sermon sitting there thinking, do I really need yet another sermon? I love sermons. Don't get me wrong. I'm thinking, I can't even remember now, 10 minutes into this, what he was saying to me this morning at half past 11, I've forgotten. Do I really need more of that? And when I came back to England, I discovered that Matt Redmond song, we've sung to death now, called Consuming Fire. There must be more than that. Now, it's easy as a senior pastor to slip into a routine. You know, same old order of service. You know, keep it contained because it's safe. Keep church in a nicely wrapped box. But you know what? I love it when God breaks in. I know that comes as a great shock to you. I love it when God breaks in because do you know what? He is capable of doing far, 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 far more than I am. Another little story that entertains me greatly that my brother told from years ago when he was out doing what in North America they call revivals and he'd preach probably from Sunday all the way through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in a, in a local church and then go home. And I remember him telling the story of they were having what we would call a Holy Ghost time. He was praying for people and all this. And the pastor was standing sort of here in his seat. And and the pastor told the story. He said, "Um, I just was standing there and I just prayed. And I said, Lord, whatever it is you need to do today to make room for you to break through, whatever it is you need to do, do it. 
And he said, just as he was saying, Amen, the power of God hit him and he fell back about five rows and was parked there at back. The power of God had hit him, right? And knocked him right out the way. And he was saying, okay, Lord. It's a bit humbling, but I, I do get the message. And so this, this comes back to the point that I'm trying to make, that, that, that the systems and processes, they're fine. Orders of service, sermon series, new strategies, our favourite programmes are great as long as they make room for God to move. Amen. As long as they're facilitators, as long as they're doorways, as long as they're openings for the move and the hand of God. So, back in the memory of that story, Jamie, you've got to unlearn a whole load of stuff. Because all those things you used to criticise sitting behind that piano, if you're not careful, they'll get back in and they'll start to constrain again. And I'm desperate to see God move because I recognise systems and processes are great. But without the supernatural hand of God, they will become just as dry as everything else. And so I've pondered that all over the years, reeling from my slap wrist. And the Lord has shown me some glimpses, I think, of what we need to do, what we need to prioritise, and what we need to emphasise. And I'm going to summarise those today in three statements that I could spend ages on each, because I love them, but I won't. And the first statement is this, number one, if you will fill this place with Jesus, filling it with people will be the least of your problems. That's number one. Number two, and I'll explain what I mean by this one, this seems slightly more obtuse, is this, too much church takes place in the pews and not enough takes place at the altar. I'll explain what I mean by that. We've had a good morning so far. I felt a bit of altar moving, shaking going on, so I'm preaching to the right audience today. And the third one is a word that the Lord whispered into my ear specifically. It's time to stop just preaching. It's time to start ministering. I'll explain just briefly what I mean by all of those said there's so much in there there's no way I can really do justice to all of that but let's look at the first one the first one is if you will fill this place with Jesus filling it with people will be the least of your problems I can remember where I was when the Holy Spirit whispered that into my ears and let's face it Jesus is I started off at my note saying Jesus is our trump card and he is our trump card but actually it's more than that Jesus is all we have Jesus is the solution to our problems He is the answer to our questions. He is the healing for our hurts, the freedom from our prisons. He is our relief from burdens. He is the love for our aching hearts. He is our identity and our security and our hope. We are well aware of that. Our challenge becomes making sure we never lose sight of that and we always do it His way. That we keep right in the forefront of our minds that this is not about us, that this is about Him. This is about his purpose, this is about his mission, this is about his agenda, and not ours. So let's look just for a minute at what Jesus did. And we can look at Acts 10, verse 38, which is an amazing verse. Acts 10, 38 talks about, i read this from the NLT, says, You know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. There's the Trinity in operation right there. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then, as a result of that, Jesus went around doing good and healing all, say all, All. thank you, just in case there's any doubt in your theology, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You know, we talked about this before. You know, Jesus, Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus emptied himself of his divine attributes, his divine power. He was no longer omnipresent. He was no longer omniscient. He was no longer omnipotent. All he was was a human who God the Father filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus' ministry, therefore, was totally Spirit-led and Spirit-empowered. And so Jesus, as this passage tells us, went around doing good, healing all, freeing the oppressed, because God the Holy Spirit was with him, was upon him, was in him. And that's our pattern. That's our pattern. That's how we are to do ministry. One of the reasons I believe that Jesus came down, I mean, Jesus was still God, but he was 100% God. He was also 100% man. One of the reasons, if Jesus had come down and done all that he did, still with his omniscience, still with his 
impotent and so on, we'd have been able to look at him and say, well, that was Jesus. Of course, it was Jesus, but Jesus did what he did in, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then you remember what he said before he, before he went away? He said to his disciples, stay here and wait until you too are clothed with power. And then we have the story of Pentecost, and that's exactly what happened. They became clothed with power. Amen. And so we are called to go out, therefore, and do what Jesus did the same way as he did. In fact, Jesus said the same miracles, the same things, the same works that I do, you, you will do even greater works than these, Amen. is what Jesus actually said, in my name. But I'd say this. I'd say there's a lot of good talk in Christendom, but the reality is that not many churches are functionally open to the move of the Spirit. So the question then becomes, how do we really open the door for the power of the Holy Spirit? See, the trouble is, I think there's a whole lot of quenching going on. Remember 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19, it's an imperative, it says, do not quench the Spirit. Amen. The Amplifier says, do not quench or subdress, suppress or subdue the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And I wonder this, do we, do we in our churches, do we pray, Lord, have control, and then kind of cling on with clenched fists? You know, is, there, is there space for us to listen? And we want him to speak, right? We want him to speak prophetically, we want him to move. Is there enough space in our worship for us to be quiet long enough to listen to hear what he's got to say? Or does this become a succession of songs until we get to the end? I mean, that's great. Is there really an openness and a maturity in the gifts of the Spirit operating in the church? I mean, again, we talk about it. People do teaching series on it. We read books on about it. That's wonderful. Functionally, are we open to all of that? Remember, systems are great. But you take out the supernatural hand of God. It's just tracks, right? You know, how much prayer for healing is there? You know, do we give an altar call Frequently, every week, so that people can get saved. You know, how much boldness, how much courage, how much risk actually is there in the church? Do not quench, suppress, or subdue the Holy Spirit. So here's what God said to me. If, if you will fill this place with Jesus, filling it with people will be the least of your problems. So I say, let's do that. Let's press into that. Let's increase in that. Because if we do that, that will move us significantly from here to there. And so then you have to ask the question, does our system, does our process facilitate that? And that's what we're trying to do, folks. The first stage of that process is meeting with God. We want to create an environment. We want to create environments where we can meet with God and where God, perhaps we should write this way around, where God can meet with us. That's what we're trying to do. Second one, and depending on how much you smile at me in the next five minutes, I might expound on this next week. The second one, and then I'll be scowling. That's another story. I'm joking. Too much church takes place in the pews and not enough in the altar. Yeah. Which half of you are scratching your head saying, first of all, I don't see an altar. And secondly, I'm not sitting on a pew. So what are you talking about? And I'm glad you asked. Let me explain. What we're talking about here is, 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 we're talking about a physical positioning, but really what we're talking about is a spiritual attitude. You know, when I read my Bible, I read James 4 verse 8, which says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I read John 7 37, which says, come to me, anyone who is thirsty, and I will give you water to drink and you will never thirst again. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. I read Proverbs 18, verse 10, which says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it. Yeah. Run to it. Yeah. And they are safe. Yet often we don't. Often we hold back. Smile at me. Say, Jamie, if you tread on my toes this morning, I forgive you. Please pray for me afterwards. Thank you. That's good. Because I think here's the danger, you see. And again, we're, we're talking about letting God in, right? So it's more than just a system. It's a move. I think we tend to do this. I think we tend to worship reservedly. We tend to preach timidly. Commit half-heartedly. 
sacrifice reluctantly, and pray safely. And I'd say, why? Why would we hold back? Given those promises that I just read, why would we hold back? And let's face it, do we really trust him? Are we really expectant? Did he really mean it when he said all things are possible to those that believe? Did he really mean it when he said that? See, I have a picture. And again, the line is, too much church takes place in the pews and not off at the altar. I have a picture in my mind. Forgive me. I have a picture of a church on their knees. More than that, I have a picture of a church on their faces. Coming, as it were, to the altar. I mean, the altar in the Old Testament, it's an Old Testament picture, right? The, the altar was the, the place of sacrifice. It was the place of worship. And I have this picture of a church that is running to the altar to get on their knees before God. Amen. As we sung earlier, arms outstretched, hearts wide open, coming before the Lord humbly and, humbly and hopefully and hungrily. And so how can we create an environment where people are responsive? People are quick to listen, quick to repent, quick to obey. And again, I can remember, I can remember on a Sunday night in Collingwood, Ontario, sitting at my piano, playing a Matt Redmond song called Face Down. And it's a very simple chorus. It just says, we fall face down as your glory shines around. And I remember singing this with my eyes closed, getting lost in the Lord, unable to fall face down because I was playing the piano, looking up and thinking, hang on a minute, we're singing this song, I don't see anybody face down. I see a lot of people hiding in their pews, if I'm honest. You know, are we singing this or not? For me, you know, you know altar calls. You know, what about, what about an altar call like, who wants more of God? I and mean, if I give an altar call, who wants more of God? I think everyone should come running forward. I, mean, I, I give you a few pass, you know, you're having a bad day or whatever. But ultimately, how do we not respond to that? Who wants more of God in their life today? Come to the front, right? And yet, are we hiding in the pews or are we running to the altar? Are we hiding in our neat rows, safe behind our chairs? And does that physical positioning represent a spiritual withholding. You know, we talk a lot about, about spiritual temperature. You know, didn't, didn't uh, John in the book of Revelation, he wrote these letters to the churches and to the church in Laodicea, he talked about them being lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. And in, in the letter he says, I, I, you know, I, I'd rather you were cold than lukewarm. I feel like spitting you out. But the picture is, he wants us to be hot. Yeah. He wants us to be hot. And so part of of our journey, our journey from here to there, is a process of softening. It's a process of opening. And ultimately, it's a process of yielding. And I'd say this this morning. We're all on that journey. Please please don't beat yourselves up. Don't beat yourselves up and think he's right. You know, I'm I'm a great one for hiding in the pews. You know, I always sit behind a really, really tall person so that no one even notices I'm here. And I, I don't want you to beat anyone up today. All I'm inviting you to do is to pray a bold prayer this morning. Why don't you pray a prayer like this that says, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm all in. Whatever you need to do in me, whatever you want to do in me, would you come and do it? I don't know about you, I've prayed that prayer a few times in my life. And it's pretty powerful when you do that. And it reminds me of Evan Roberts in the Welsh Revival, who, whose prayer was this, bend me, Lord. I'm getting a bit older now. Bending me is a pretty tricky proposition, at least physically. Bend me, Lord. And then there's that wonderful Brooke Fraser song, a Hosanna, the Hill song, said, break my heart for what breaks yours. I love that. Break my heart. Break my stony, cold heart for what breaks yours, that I might have a soft, squidgy, responsive, tender heart. And then a line that the Guy Chevreau quotes from time to time. Lord, if there's anything about If there's anything about which you and I disagree, I give you complete permission to change my mind. Think about that. Does too much church take place in the pews and not enough at the altar? And the third one, I'm going through these really fast. Aren't you impressed? The third one is time to stop just preaching. I put the word just in. I think in the original, when the Lord spoke to me, it's time to stop preaching and start ministering. 
And again, I can remember exactly where I was. I was at HTB at the first leadership conference, and I, and I was just between uh, Collingwood and Bidford, uh, and I was about to start here, actually. And I felt that God said to me, it's time to stop preaching and start ministering. And, and let's put a bit of backdrop into that. I just spent the best part of three years in Collingwood at what I affectionately call preaching school. Because I was required to preach every Sunday morning. I was required to preach every Sunday night. We had a midweek Thursday night service, and then once a fortnight we had healing school on a Tuesday night. So I was required to preach four times a week. So suffice it to say, I had a lot of practice. Might not show, but I had a lot of practice. And we did whittle that down a little bit. I mean, Guy told me that, that you know, there's no way anyone should be able to preach more than about 40 times a year, um, which sounds, sounds good to me, much so I love preaching. Uh, and and uh, into, that, into that season of my life, and it was a significant season, God planted Guy Chevreau as my mentor, and he was a tough teacher. But when I say it's time for you to stop just ministering, and stop preaching and start ministering, it, it's not because I don't believe in preaching. I do, wholeheartedly. I believe in the power of the word. I believe in expanding truth. I believe in shining light. I believe that preaching should be compelling and bold and passionate. I believe all of those things. But, here's the point. Preaching is a means to an end. I've been in too many church services where the preaching was the end. I'm literally, amen. So if preaching is the means, the end is that God gets in. That's the end, is that God gets in. And here's the point again, in case you haven't got it. Without the supernatural hand of God, preaching is just another talk. Interesting, maybe, too long, probably, in one ear and out the other, hopefully not. Without the finger of God on it. You see, we need to let God in. We need to hear what he has to say. I need to hear what God has to say to me. I need God to stir my heart. I need him to mould my will. Anyone else stubborn around here? I need God to renew my mind. Don't say that quite so enthusiastically. I need need God to renew my mind and my thinking. I need to think his thoughts. I need need God to correct my errors. There are things I need to unlearn and things I need to relearn, as he so graciously reminded me outside William's Coffee Pub. I need his word to inform my decisions. And I often close... My preach was something like this. You know, you have heard thousands of words spoken to you this morning. What I want to know is what is the one word, the one word that the Holy Spirit has whispered into your ears. Not that I don't spend time and energy in the thousands of words, but ultimately what is the one word, the single word, the tag, the line, the phrase, the instruction that the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And then once he speaks it, we have to respond. You know, we understand, don't we, because we've been taught it, that, that it's not just about hearing, actually it's about doing. It's one thing to hear it, it's another thing to do it, because guess what produces the fruit? Guess what produces the results? I don't think it's that we've heard too much, or I don't think, sorry, I don't think it's that we haven't heard enough, I think it's that we haven't done enough what we've already heard. That was my Sunday morning, Sunday night thing. Why am I sitting in church on a Sunday night having another message when I haven't done that one yet? I'm still trying to get my head around that one. You know, we understand that it's not a matter just of hearing, but it's a matter of doing. We understand that the God confirms the word with signs and wonders following. In other words, when God speaks, his power is readily available and he acts as a result of that. God confirms the word. We speak it and God does it. So if God is in the moment, go, jump, run, be all over that. If, if there's a priest that, that, promised, that, that focuses on a specific promise of God, stick your hand up and say yes, and come running, go grab hold of that thing. Because when God speaks, he acts. Yeah. You see, a Sunday morning service for me is a, is a curve. It, it's a journey, it's a progression. You know, praise is the gate into his presence. Read Psalm 100. We enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and we enter his courts with praise. That's how, we, that's how we break through the outer door and get in through praise. And then worship opens our hearts, prepares our hearts for the word. And then the word prepares our hearts again 
for our response, for possibly even for ministry. And my, my picture of that is, is that the service should be like, like surgery. You know, there's a careful preparation. God makes a neat incision in your heart and then does deep work. And then at the end, he carefully sews it up again, stitches it up and you're ready to go. Amen. You know, so for me, a service is a curve. It has a start, it has a middle, has an end. It has to go somewhere. It has to do something. It has to change us. Because as 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, we are being transformed from glory to glory. Every Sunday morning should be a further step from one degree of glory to another. Perhaps another step from here to there. Amen. So if all that is the case, that, that does place a demand on me or whoever it is that's speaking on that Sunday morning. You know, I mentioned before, Guy's annoying prod in my ribs one Sunday, go deeper. And I was thinking to myself, that was pretty darn deep. What are you talking about? Didn't you hear all those scriptures? Did you hear my Greek words? And all, all the points I made, but that's not what he meant at all. You understand? So there is a responsibility for me to dig for gold. You know, to find the applications. Not just to take you so far and give you this great commission, then dump you and say, well, good luck. Hope you find your way around that. Don't know how that works on a Monday morning for you? Go for it. My, my job is to find those applications. My, my job is to make it practical for you. My job is to make it penetrating and to make it persuasive. There's a demand on me. But there's also a demand on you. What are you going to do with this? You know, is it about the race to the coffee queue? I understand that, by the way. Is it about the race to the coffee queue or is it asking yourself tough questions? Is it asking the Lord to search your heart? You know, Lord, what is the challenge for me today? What are you, how are you calling me to respond? And if you are, how, how do I go about that? And remember again, without the Holy Spirit, any process, any program, any preach becomes dry. But with him, it comes alive. And we've got a choice. The choice is, Meeting with God or going through the motions? I don't know which one I choose. Okay, let's wrap this thing up then. Process is fine as long as it really is about letting God in. You know, process will help us to get from here to there as long as we recognize that it is merely a tool. And its purpose, the purpose of that tool is to make room for God. You know, meeting with God, walking with God and serving God is the means. The end is God on the move. That's what we need. In other words, God is supernaturally in that meeting. We need to get God supernaturally in that walking. We need to get God supernaturally in our serving. Remember that vision statement earlier? That, that description of there? I'm convinced that the good news is that if we really will meet with God, if we really will walk with God corporately, individually, if we really will serve God corporately, individually, within the four walls of the church, without, if we really will do that and we really do let God in it, then guess what? This will, will be a church that is alive. Amen. It will be a church that is spirit-filled. It will be about transformation. The church will grow. We will find ourselves being equipped and empowered and released. Amen. If we will let God in. What I've been preaching these few weeks is, is a process, yes. But it's a means to an end. Amen. And the end is we need to fill this place with Jesus. Amen. We need to be on our knees at the altar. We need to be responding whenever he calls us. And if we will do that, God will be in it. I'll close with this final thought. You know the picture the picture of the train. Can you stick that first picture up for me, Steve? The, the train on the tracks. The first message was, who wants to get on the train? It's good, isn't it? It's a good train. You know, cafe, bar, you know, comfy seats, Wi-Fi. Who wants to get on the train? And out of that, people were saying, yeah, do you know what, Cal, I want to be on that train. And then the next couple of weeks, you've talked about, okay, now we've got this train loaded. Are we going to put it on the right tracks? If that's where we're going, what tracks? Are we going to put it on tracks that are going to send us over here? I'm going to put it on tracks that are going to send us over here. Are we going to get it on the right tracks that are going to send us in the direction that we need to go, which is over there? That dream, that promised land. Today, 
is about the fuel. Today is about the fuel. So we have a train there. The first thing that train needs is full of people. It's on the tracks. It's ready to go. The driver's in his seat. But if you have no fuel, guess what? You're going to stay in the station. And too many people are stuck in the station because they have no fuel. And what's, what's fuel, oil, a picture of in the Bible? Pretty simple, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the fuel that we need. And we need enough fuel to get us from here to there. We need to have an abundance of fuel. And our job is to make sure that that train is regularly filled with fuel. Is that a good picture? Yeah. Let's pray. If Ali would like to come up, that would be great. We'll pray. Father, we are well aware of what it is like to be sitting on that train stuck in the station without any fuel, frustrated with the same old view of a grey, dirty station when we could be racing off into the fields and heading towards our destination. And so, Father, our prayer this morning is very simple. Would you fill our train with fuel? Lord, we need you. We need the power and the presence and the voice and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to meet with you, we want to walk with you, we want to serve you, but Lord, we want all of that to be empowered by you so we really are meeting with you. We really are walking with you and it's engaging and it's dynamic and we really are serving you and it's powerful and it's effective and it's fruitful. But that will only happen if you are in there and if our tanks are full of fuel. So Lord, I pray this this morning, Lord, would you come and empower everything that we do in this church? Would you come and change in us anything, everything that needs to be changed, anything that's standing in the way, anything that's slowing us down, anything that's causing us to hide when we should be running? Lord, would you come and do that this morning? Would you come and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit? Would you empower everything that we do? In Jesus' name.